Yo, 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 what it do, what it be, it's your boy A and T repping the game, gang, you know we don't play none of that, all of that, let's get right into it, another episode of Hip Hop History coming at you, and I've discussed how hip hop shifted away from the DJ to the MC uh, with hits like Rapper's Delight and The Message and hip hop moving away from live club events and moving into the music industry fueled that shift but one infamous rap battle took place in december 1981 at a spot called harlem world between cool mo d and busy b star ski now cool mo d an artist like grandmaster kaz and and a young big daddy kane and later others like rock him krs1 big daddy kane people like that They were doing this new style of rap where, sure, it was less about getting the party hype with callbacks and chants. Now, they still wanted to rock the party and rock the crowd, but they also wanted to personally diss their opponent. Now, Busy B. Starsky would set up these competitions around New York and local venues. Whichever MC rocked the party the most would win. Now, usually these would end with Busy B going on last and using the same chants and callbacks and he would rock the party and win. Well, then Busy B started saying he could beat anybody in a battle and he had set up a competition in Harlem World where, you you know, I'm a knockout all bums and, you know, he was doing his Ali kind of impression thing. And well, somehow Cool Mo D signed up late and he wanted to go on after Busy B, which was somehow allowed i don't know how they didn't tell busy b and of this it was a surprise attack as and this is that's how cool modi and busy b both say it. it was a surprise that cool modi was going on last now there's actually a cassette tape of this it was floating around and it's actually on youtube if you look up the busy b and uh cool modi battle and to basically summarize what happens busy b starts off And he's doing, you know, the old school MC thing, ball with the ball, dang a dang, all of that. And he's asking the girls, you know, what Zodiac signs they are. He's asking the crowd, you know, what fast food restaurants. Very, which one of y'all like to eat at? Blimpies, you know, clap your hands if you eat at McDonald's. Bruh, literally, this is how dude was rapping, right? And now it it sounds whack, but you got to think, everybody just out partying trying to have a good time they they don't really know what good rhymes are yet until busy b stepped on and i i highly recommend the watch because you can listen and literally feel the shift in hip-hop's force from when busy b stops rapping and cool mode starts and then when I say Cool Modi verbally assaulted Busy B, I mean he massacred this man. Told him he was whack. Bit his name from Lovebug Starsky, which he did. Said he bit his whack ass rhymes from Spoonie G, which I, I believe is actually true. Bro exposed him and had the crowd going crazy. Plus, Cool Modi was switching up his flow and was displaying a prime example of what the new MC of the future was going to sound like. And this battle essentially marked the end of the callback or the hype man MC, if you will. And it furthered hip hop's evolution as this single battle influenced and changed how MCs rapped as a whole. And even now you have, you know, the difference between mainstream hip hop and rap battles today. Now, Cool Mo D and Cold Crush Bros and, and Big Daddy Kane, they built their reps as battle rappers and having nice pen games. And even after the battle, Mo D and Busy B remained friends, you know. And this actually, Cool Mo D, this wouldn't even be his high, most highly publicized battle because he took on, and some argue that he beat LL Cool J. In, in a, a main street, like, they had diss records towards each other back and forth, right? And people say that Cool Mo D beat LL Cool J. Now, when I cover LL Cool J, for sure, I'm a definite, or end Cool Mo D's careers, I'm going I'm to talk more about it. But, no, there was, I mean, not, basically, it all stemmed from, I believe, Cool Mo D uh, was in the Juice Crew, and he and... 
uh, Marley Marl thought LL was stealing their rhymes, which is, a, again, why uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute without uh, Cool Mo D. But, uh, or, or in Big Daddy Kane, even. But Cool Mo D thought LL Cool J was stealing his shit, so he went to war with him. Now, of course, LL was the main, more mainstream guy. He was the more popular. The ladies love LL, all that. And, uh, of course, he won the, the popularity contest. But for some people, Cool Mo D destroyed LL on the mic. In, in, in When you go bar for bar. So I And, again, I'll talk more about that when I cover both of their careers. But fast forward to 1985 and battling and beef would kind of take a more serious turn when boogie down productions and the juice crew would beef over a misunderstanding from the juice crew song the bridge now i believe this is the first beef that would brew from a misunderstanding from a song but it damn sure wouldn't be the last because I'll, I'll discuss more rivalries in the future for show as beef and fallouts between rappers have gained more publicity since the whole east and west rivalry and unfortunately uh these beefs have led to some talented artists losing their lives but thankfully in this beef known as the bridge wars nobody lost their life but in a sense it would kill a piece of hip-hop's innocence because Sure, artists from all genres may not like each other, but unlike those other genres, rappers will air out their grievances against other rappers on wax and make it a hit record. We've seen it numerous times. Hit em up, uh, Truth, uh, uh, we got, what else? The Warning by Eminem. Any Eminem diss, really. When Eminem was mad, Mad Eminem is really the best Eminem. Except when he be trying, you know, his latest disses with Nick Cannon were trash. But this isn't about Eminem beefs because those are kind of trash. And I'll, again, cover that in a future video. But in order to fully understand the Bridge Wars, let's first look at the Juice Crew, which was created by Marley Marl. And his feud with DJ Red Alert would start all of this hullabaloo that we about to get into. So, Mr. Magic was also a part of the Juice Crew, but he was an on-air radio DJ that played rap records on the radio. I believe Mr. Magic and DJ Red Alert were the only two doing this at the time, they were, and they were both based in New York, so it was really just like, okay, which which one is the better one? Which one is going to have the better hit records? You know, which one is going to drop the better fire? Now, of course, Mr. Magic's Rap Attack and Marley Marl are both famously shouted out on Biggie's song, Juicy, but rapper wise in 1984 they had mc shan and roxanne shante few other names but big daddy kane and biggest marquee would wouldn't come along until around 1986 that that's when they would come around and join the juice crew and this is key because before marley marl and mr c would go on this legendary run in the late 80s with big daddy kane and, and biz for show they found out that the beef can ignite your career and it can turn around and end it so let's start in 1984 you know shout out to big brother and all them but dj red alert puts out a record from a group called utfo called roxanne roxanne which is a song that you know it, depic it depicts all of the members of utfo trying to spit game to a young woman named roxanne who was fictitious she was not real it was just a song until a na uh, a girl named lolita shante gooden aka roxanne shante would meet marley marl and i guess utfo didn't show up to some kind of radio event or something for marley marl or mr magic and they they wanted revenge or they felt slighted somehow and Marley Marl asked Roxanne Shantae to come record some, some freestyles or whatever. And he puts on this UTFO or this beat or whatever and asks her to do this freestyle against UTFO. And she does it. She does it. And by, she basically dropped a response record to Roxanne Roxanne 
He's saying that she was the Roxanne, and these guys are fucking bums. So, Marley took her to the studio, and again, I, they did a seven-minute freestyle in one take that they, they dissed the fuck out of UF, UTFO. Like I said, called them bums. I'm the real Roxanne. Yeah, I met these bums in real life. This is how it really went. Da -da 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 -da. The song would be called Roxanne's Revenge, and it was, you know, a hit throughout New York. And with this one diss record, Roxanne Shante was now officially in the Juice Crew. And I will definitely talk more about Roxanne Shante and other women pioneers in hip hop in a future video. But Roxanne's revenge started what some people call the Roxanne Wars. Because after Roxanne, Roxanne hit, and then she did Roxanne's revenge, then everybody wanted to make a response record to it. One response was one guy pretending to be Roxanne's brother. The other guy was pretending to be uh, Roxanne's doctor. Then another dude made Roxanne's a man and claimed that Roxanne was actually his homie that went to jail and came out a woman. It was, yo, the 80s was wild, son. The 80s was real wild, let me just tell you. And, and keep in mind, those songs are about a completely fictitious woman named Roxanne and not really towards Roxanne Shante. But y'all get it. Response records aren't really a thing anymore, but it, it was a dope concept for its time. Quickly wore out its novelty welcome, though. So, DJ Red Alert saw Marley and the Juice Crew basically dissing these artists he put out, which, and of course, he took that personally. And UTFO's response was whack as hell. So Juice Crew had the one up in the beef in 1984. Fast forward one year to late 1985, and MC Shan drops the Marley Marl produced track, The Bridge. And the opening lines of the song, listen, they just got off tour, they want to tell you a story about where they come from. And this is key. Because the next lines go something like, You love to hear the story again and again of how it all got started way back when. The monument is right in your face. Sit and listen for a while for the name of the place. The, the bridge. All right, And then it goes into the, you know, the, the hook or whatever. But on the record that the bridge was on, the A side of the record or of the cassette was a disc from MC Shan to LL Cool J called Beat Biter because Marley Marl also thought LL was stealing his juice like you know Kumo D did so everybody thought LL was stealing their shit but really I mean Rick Rubin was producing it and Rick Rubin had nothing to do with anybody so let's just get that out the way LL never responded because he was on the rise of superstardom, so he didn't. He wasn't listening to Shan or none of these, you know. He was already signed, so he he had either never heard of it or he didn't care that someone that wasn't on his level was talking about him on Wax. But LL never responded, and that beef never really went anywhere. However, KRS-One and DJ Scott LaRock, aka Boogie Down Produ Productions, heard the bridge track. And they thought that the Juice Crew was trying to claim hip hop started in Queensbridge. And they weren't having that. Plus, they already felt slighted by Marley Marl and Mr. Magic. Now, according to KRS One, he they they did an audition for Marley Marl for them to play a track on the radio. And or either that uh, Marley Marl has said that they were trying to join the Juice Crew. I believe MC Shan has also said that, but I don't think they were trying to join. Maybe they were just trying to break a record on, but who really knows? But MC Shan said that uh, Marley told them, or it was either Marley or Mr. Magic told them that they were fucking whack. And, you know, and it was this was before KRS One had really even come out. This was like, you know, uh, before Boogie Down's uh, criminal minded lay or criminal minded album dropped to its critically critical success and all that critically acclaimed album and all that, this was something different. So they they did like an audition tape or something for Mr. Magic or and they wasn't feeling it or something happened on that. That combined with them dropping the bridge, that that was all they needed. That was just you know the spark to the you know the ignition that was already there. So. This prompted KRS-One and Scott LaRock to record the response record called 
South Bronx. And he dropped this tape off to Red Alert. DJ Red Alert. Who played it at the club. And the crowd in Bronx went fucking bananas. You feel me? Like They heard that shit. They said they played it one time. Motherfuckers went crazy. They tried to play another song over that. Well, he played it like three, four times in a row. Then they tried to play another song over that. And they was chanting South Bronx over whatever song bro was playing. So... I mean, they already knew you in the club, and they had one, bro. They had. We said we got the crowd going lit. Yup, we got one right here. So, South Bronx was popping so hard it made the radio, and it prompted MC Shan to respond with this song, "Kill That Noise." And look, if if Shan don't drop "Kill That Noise" and just followed LL Cool J's route and ignored KRS One, who knows? how KRS-One's career would have played out. He claims that he wouldn't have a career if MC Shan don't diss him back. But I kind of doubt that because KRS-One is so fucking talented, to me at, at least. But after Kill That Noise, BDP dropped the bridges over and absolutely killed the whole fucking Juice crew. They said MC Shan was whack. Marley Marl's out of touch. He don't know what the youth like to listen to. They they should stop smoking crack. Roxanne Shante was only good for getting hit from the back. All that. Bro was spazzing on the track. On top of that, he dropped the legendary lines. He said, Manhattan keeps on making it. Brooklyn keeps on taking it. Bronx keeps creating it. And Queens keeps on faking it. KRS-One was in his fucking bag on the bridges over. And sure, the Juice crew tried to respond, but they wasn't fucking with the bridges over. The beef lasted for decades after this, however, but it's important to note that KRS-1 and Big Daddy Kane never dissed each other. Despite Big Daddy Kane being Juice Crew, same with Biz Marquee, they came in shortly before the beef kicked off, and KRS-1 and Big Daddy Kane were actually friends before rap. But Big Daddy Kane did write Roxanne Shantae's Have a Nice Day record, which did take shots at Boogie Down Productions. And MC Shan and Marley Marl and KRS-One, they weren't on good terms for decades. But they buried the hatchet in the mid-2000s. And Marley and KRS-One came together for a joint album called Hip Hop Lives in 2007. They got a hit on that called uh, Hip Hop's Back. I recommend checking it out. That shit slap. But uh, that was 20 years after uh, Boogie Down Productions' DJ Scott LaRock was shot and killed during an unrelated fight in 1987 at a club. And his killers would never be found, which unfortunately would become a trend until recently because now the, the killers brag about it on social media. But R.I.P. DJ Scott LaRock, for real, for real. And Mr. Magic, he passed away in 2009 from a heart attack at 53 years old. R.I.P. to both of them. But hip-hop has changed a lot since BDP went to war with the Juice Crew on Wax. But rappers beefing and throwing shots at one another on a record is nothing new and it's, it's perpetual it'll it'll always be there i'll talk more about these rivalries during the series and even now with how popular battle rap is it's definitely come a long way since the cool mo d and busy b battle and as a fan i'm observing both hip-hop and battle rap change and evolve sometimes for the worst sometimes for the better but either way i'm happy to witness hip-hop history and cover it on this channel and if you like this video, like and subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can stay tuned for all the hot content I got dropping soon. It's been your boy, A-N-T, you know me, repping the G-A-M-E, G-A-N-G, game, gang, you know we don't play none of that, all of that, y'all. Be safe, don't get smoked. I got, like, two minutes left on this video. If you don't want to peep the rest of this and watch me just... You know, do my little magician shit. You feel me? I'm not, bro. I'm telling you, you want the Harry Potter, motherfucking Harry Houdini. They ain't got nothing on me. Free all the real ones in Escaban on that Dementor time. You know, no, for real. But uh, I'm out, y'all. Be safe. Don't get smoked. Peace.